All right, so good afternoon, everyone, or good evening, depending on where you're joining us from. Um, I'm Daisha McFall, the Assistant Head of Admissions at the Institute for Advanced Analytics at NC State. We are actually home to the nation's first professional graduate program in analytics and data science. Um, the Institute was founded in 2007, and we saw our first graduating class in 2008. Since then, we have been fortunate enough to train nearly 1,000 alumni who are now working in the field as professional data scientists and analysts. Um, and today, we have some of them joining us to talk with you a little bit about data justice. So as our footprint in the field of analytics has grown, so has our commitment to educating and um, in outreach efforts to equip folks with not only knowledge about what data scientists do, but some of the skills they can use to prepare themselves to become um, strong data analysts, but also responsible data analysts or data scientists in their day-to-day -day work. So without further ado, I will pass it off to Kelsey Campbell, who is a graduate from the class of 2016. Kelsey. All right, thank you. Uh, so hi everyone, and thanks for joining us for Book Buffet. Uh, we're so excited to have you for the Lunch and Learn and give you a taste of what uh, the field of data justice is. There's some really awesome books and resources. Uh, but first, let's talk a little bit about what we mean, Oops, sorry, when we say data justice. Uh, so in recent years, you might have seen the many, many headlines about biases in machine learning or artificial intelligence having unintended consequences. And at the core of this is really the idea that data or technology is anything but neutral. It's created from a world with a long history of racism, sexism, colonialism, classism, and many other oppressions. And because algorithms or models are only as good as the data you put into them or how they're implemented, we are seeing all of these historical oppressions get baked into automated systems and really cause real world harm on a bigger scale. So this has given rise to a new field that's sometimes called data ethics or algorithmic justice. So at a high level, just trying to figure out if and how we can use data or design algorithms that correct or at least not perpetuate these existing oppressions in society. So this is a complex and heavy topic for sure, uh, but on special today, uh, we have six really great IAA alums and students ready to work up your appetite for these important issues. Uh, so we have six courses today. Each one will be a three to five minute lightning talk about a data justice book or resource. And then for dessert, uh, we will have time for a discussion or a Q and A. Uh, and so with that, uh, we'll jump right in. And first up, we have Emily with our first data justice resource. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Kelsey. Um, can you all see the screen? Yes, okay, great. Uh, so my name is Emily Hadley and I'm gonna be kicking us off by serving a review of Algorithms of Oppression, How Search Engines Reinforce Racism by Dr. Safia Noble. Uh, a little bit about me, I am a graduate of the Institute for Advanced Analytics. I graduated with the class of 2018. I currently work as a research data scientist at RTI International. I published a Medium post last year called Five Steps to Take as an Anti-Racist Data Scientist that really uh, is the framework and foundation for a lot of the work that I do today. This particular book, uh, Dr. Noble was inspired to write it based off of this search that she did in 2011. Uh, she searched for the bl term Black girls on Google. And as you can see from this image here, nearly all of the responses were related to pornography. Dr. Noble spends a really uh, great chunk of the book exploring how Google's algorithms and their page ranking algorithms at the time caused something like this to happen. But she also dives into much deeper um, understanding of the, the racist and sexist tendencies in society that are being amplified through this algorithm. And one of her key overarching points is that the way we are searching for knowledge has changed. The mode that we use to look for knowledge has changed. Previously, we often went to libraries, which are generally publicly funded, managed by librarians who have library science degrees, and they have rules and regulations about what type of information they collect and how they share and organize it. 
Google is oftentimes seen as you know a, a similar resource for knowledge, um, but they're not a public institution. They're not managed by librarians. They don't have the same rules and regulations that they have to follow. And pretty much the key piece of this book is that search engines are not neutral. They are not a public good. When you see those search results, those search results are generated from an algorithm that has its own biases. And one of the biggest items that's often forgotten when you're interacting with a search algorithm like Google is that they are not search companies, they are advertising companies. And they make money by having you click on items. Um, and it is to their uh, algorithms are, are meant to create items that you click on. Um, and what ends up happening is that the people who devise these algorithms to get you to click on particular items um, are oftentimes reflecting their own societal biases in the development of these algorithms, which there goes to continue to uh, reflect the racism, sexism, homophobia, anti-Semitism that we see in society is oftentimes replicated in search engines like Google, which have pretty much become a monopoly for Im information that you might collect in search. There are real world implications to these biased algorithms and these biased search results. This here is a snapshot of the transcript from Dylan Roof, the murderer who committed the Charleston church shootings back in 2015. And he explicitly said that it was a Google search for black on white crime that returned pages and pages of information from the Council of Conservative Citizens, which is a known hate group on uh, false information related to uh, black on white crimes. And he cited this as a motivating factor for the, the murders that he ended up committing for the nine people who died in the church shootings in 2015. <sighs> Today, if you were to search black on white crime, you see something really different. You see the FBI statistics on black and white crime. You see a fact check of this false notion that there's a crisis of black on white crime in society, showing that Google can choose to show different algorithm results when it's forced to. And that's also the really big takeaway from, from the book that Dr. Noble written is that search algorithms are not neutral, which also means that they can be changed. And so some of the ideas that Dr. Noble proposed were first increasing diversity in tech and related that people who are designing tech need to have an, a training and education on the histories of marginalized people so that the search algorithms that are being developed are not just perpetuating um, the mm -hmm. challenges that we currently face in society. She's also a strong advocate for federal US regulations of search engines and even proposed a thought experiment or even a real world experiment of what a public search engine might look Look like one that's not coming from an advertising company. There's a lot more in the book. I highly recommend it. Um, it's a great text and I'm going to pass it on to Marshall. Great. Thank you, Emily. So today, not sharing, is it? So today I'm going to talk about um, Virginia Eubanks. Um, it's not showing up for me. Automating inequality: it's how high-tech tools profile police and punish the poor. Um, so the moral of the story, the thing to keep in mind, is that when it comes to algorithms, function follows form. Many of you have probably heard Dr. Labar say something like SAS is a really good calculator. Algorithms are the same. So they are very good at doing what we ask them to do. So she gives us three incredible stories about um, the ways that different parts of the United States have tried to implement algorithms uh, in order to make social services more efficient, better cost cutting, things like that. Um, and sort of the how these, uh, these algorithms have impacted the people um, in a really negative way, no matter that the intention was to make things better. So her first story happens in the state of Indiana. So let's discuss the problem for a second. So in 2006, the state of Indiana signs a contract with IBM in order to automate their processes for entry into the state welfare program. So originally they had state caseworkers like by the county level 
and they decided to move all the caseworkers to a centralized location. And they took the cases that were assigned to like individual caseworkers and forced them into a triage system. So what this meant is that if you were signing up for welfare, you would never have the same caseworker at any given time. It would always go just like by the order that you called in um, every single day. And here's what happened. The automated eligibility services led to no accountability and very vague failure to cooperate notices. And what that means is that if, for example, someone had forgotten to sign something on line 17 on page 34 of their application, then they would automatically be flagged for fraud and failed to cooperate. So that means that their services were cut off and they were forced to apply again. And these are people who don't have a lot of resources. And so they don't have a lot of time, for example, to be able to reapply. And they're under the stress that their uh, benefits were being cut off. And so ultimately what happened is this $1.34 billion contract that was supposed to save the state of Indiana money led to million dollar denials of benefits. And that was a 54% increase from the year before. So that's not good. Program eventually ended about three years after its implementation. So the next is the city of Los Angeles. And here's the problem. The LA has like 58,000 unhoused people um, at the time of writing. So uh, that's the second highest in the nation. And so the city was like, okay, what is the best way that we can uh, allocate our resources? So they created the Coordinated Entry Services System, which was literally described as the match.com of homeless resources. And so in theory is supposed to match the most needy with the appropriate resources. Okay. Unfortunately, what happened was each participant had to create or take part in this incredibly invasive survey and they consented to it, um, but really they needed the resources. So they, they didn't have a choice, right? And so I asked things like, where can we find you during the day? Are you trading sex for drugs? And that's really invasive, right? And 161 agencies had access to the information, including LAPD. And the police officers from then on did not need a warrant. They had no oversight or no record of accessing this information um, for all these people who are homeless. But furthermore, they were enticed to make themselves appear more needy because only the most needy um, received resources. But the moral of the story here is that maybe the solution is not to allocate resources better, but to create better resources, right? If you have 20 homeless people and only 10 homes, the solution is not to allocate the homes the best way, it's to create 10 more homes. And so the last story occurs in Allegheny County. So the Department of Human Services wanted to predict which children are more likely to become victims of abuse. So they had about a billion records, but not enough information collected equally around the people, right? The data mostly came from like inner city families um, that mostly interacted with the Department of Resources. And this tended to be poor and working families. And here's what happened. So the model itself ended up using proxies of mistreatment and not measures of mistreatment itself. And so uh, what happened was black and biracial families were um, reported for abuse and neglect three and a half times more often than white families. And this is mostly due to things like geographical location. Um, white families lived more out in the suburbs. If they had issues with children, they would like hire a nanny because they were richer, things like that. So it became a false positive and a false negative issue. Seeing harm where there is no harm because black families were more likely to be in the system anyway, so it would flag those more often and a false negative issue because white families were less likely to be in the system, so they were less likely to be picked up in uh, cases of abuse. So what can we learn? Algorithms are good at, being uh, good at doing what they're told, you know, function follows form. Um, ultimately, intent is irrelevant, but impact is the most important thing to consider. And we cannot aim for neutral al algorithms. Neutral technologies are designed to protect and promote the status quo. And in order to really address inequality in the United States, we have to do it on purpose. So now I'll toss it over to Kelsey to discuss data feminism. Awesome, thank you. These are these are so interesting. Those were two books that I haven't read yet. So I'm just really excited to uh, hear y'all's review. Um, 
But here we go. So next up we have, uh, we'll be serving Data Feminism, which is a really awesome book that came out last year. Uh, and once again, my name is Kelsey Campbell. I am a 2016 alum and I'm currently working at a small software company in DC. And I'm also the founder of Gata Science, which is a site devoted to highlighting the LGBTQ plus experience using data science and analytics. So Data Feminism is a book that gives an introduction to data science through an intersectional feminist lens. Uh, one of the authors has a computing background and one of them has more of a historian, is more of a historian. So they bring this really cool mix of historical context and frameworks to modern data and tech issues. And I have some of the feminist concepts that they introduce on the slide here with intersectionality being a term coined by Kimberly Crenshaw, explaining how facets of identity don't just exist independent of one another. They very much interact in complex ways that influence our experience in the world. So the inspiration for this was a legal case where a black woman was facing hiring discrimination, um, but it wasn't being recognized because the same company actively hired both black men and white women. So intersectionality finally gave a name to this discrimination she was facing on the basis of her race and gender. Today, this concept has been expanded to include many other dimensions like class, ability, sexual orientation, and more. And from a data perspective, it's important to consider the experiences of intersectional identities instead of just considering characteristics in isolation. You know, if you're ignoring the reality of intersecting or compounding discrimination, you're just not gonna get the full picture. Positionality is related to intersectionality, but with more of a self-awareness type aspect. It involves being aware of the identities and the experiences and the privileges that you hold and how that influences or biases your understanding of the world. So also definitely very important for anyone working with data because you're going to impose those biases into the analyses that you do. The matrix of domination is a framework that describes the different levels of privilege and oppression that exist in our society, from structural laws and policies to how they're enforced, to how they're legitimized by our culture and media, to finally how they're experienced by different individuals. And it's important to understand the larger context of where your data comes from and how it's reflecting these on all these different levels. I wanted to share this book today um, because it actually influenced the title of the series a little bit. Um, as part of their discussion on the matrix of domination and kind of power in general, data feminism argues for practices that are very deliberate in challenging oppression. Uh, and they start by suggesting that we shift the words that we use to discuss these issues. So for example, instead of using a term like data ethics, which is kind of squishy, you know, something ethical to me might mean something very different than what's ethical for you. Uh, they suggest that we use a term like data justice, which in contrast is very upfront about the goals that we have for using data. And you can see other sorts of substitutions that they suggest here as well, um, which I really like and I've tried to start adopting in the way that I talk about these things. Um, I'm someone that believes that language is very important and that having a structural framing for this kind of stuff can help us make meaningful progress. Uh, so power is only one aspect that the book discusses. They actually lay out seven principles of data feminism from elevating emotion embodiment, rethinking binaries and hierarchies, making labor visible. Uh, and each one of these is really well thought out and researched and they provide so many examples about what the principle looks like in practice. Uh, my favorite principle is the chapter that's about elevating emotion and embodiment, uh, which focuses on data visualization. And they challenge this dominant idea that data should speak for itself and be objective. And they explain how this is one, impossible because everything is biased in some way. And two, based on this false binary between emotion and reason, which of course is very much historically uh, gendered and masking a hierarchy. So they have a lot of really great points about um, how you can create and celebrate the human aspect of data visualization and create visuals that people really feel and connect to, such as this one that really communicates the loss aspect of gun violence. Uh, so they advocate for data visceralization instead of data visualization, which I thought was clever. Um, <laughs> but that is all I'll share about data feminism for now. Um, but the absolute coolest part is that it's actually open access. So all of you can go to this site right now and read the whole book for free, uh, which I definitely recommend. There's a lot more in there. And um, yeah, and with that, 
Uh, that's all I have for data feminism, and we will move to Elena. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Elena Snavely. I graduated back in 2014. I have been at SAS since then, um, first building models, then selling models that SAS wanted to build. Um, and now I lead a group of people who build models for SAS. Um, and I wanted to talk about that because my journey has been um, a little slower um, than some of the other people, I think, in the panel. Um, when I was in sales, I had a discussion with a customer who said, you know, Elena, how do you make sure your models aren't racist? And I was like, models be racist? Like, we didn't talk about that at the Institute. Um, th that seems silly, right? Like, how would a healthcare model be racist? Um, and then I did my homework and like, Right, I had my like very aha moment, and you know, ever since then, it's it's pretty much all I want to talk about um, bias in AI, um, which brings me to the book that I then discovered, which was sort of an equally eye-opening experience. Um, Kelsey, if you would please, um, which is um, Caroline Criado Perez's book, Invisible Women, um, that is about how sort of on the whole, how all society is default male, um, but in very specific ways that relate to data as well. And then that applied to me. So this was like my aha moment um, for sort of gender bias. So if you wanna go to the next slide, please. Um, so we have a default male right in the middle that I'm gonna make you all stare at for the next three minutes. Um, and, you know, I think she doesn't have a call to action so much as just like, hey, and did you realize this? It's it's like having a really long dinner party with a person who knows a lot of really cool facts. Um, and so she talks about daily life, workplace, design, doctors, public life, and what do you do when it goes wrong? Um, and I represented that with some food because she has some great examples of when there's a famine and everyone gets together and says what they need, and then a bunch of cornmeal gets delivered, but no one thought to ask for fuel. That's because they didn't ask any of the women what they needed. And all of the men in the group were like, well, right, we get the cornmeal and then, and then the food comes out. And, and they don't realize that the cooking happens in between because there weren't any women in the data collection process of what they needed in the famine. Um, so she has just a ton of these examples. Um, personally, I find the design and the medicine part um, important to me as a data scientist. Um, Emily talked a little bit about search algorithms um, and that just goes like everywhere, right? With Google, right? Image searches, I search for the image search of an author. Only 25% of authors that come back are women, even though in reality, that's 56%. 11% of images of CEOs are women. Um, voice recognition software doesn't work for me. Um, when I translate things from Turkish to English, doctors are always men. Nurses are always women, right? It's just all of these sort of examples of like, no, you can't just use Google Translate there. It's like a really, really bad idea. Um, then there's the annoying things, right? Like Samsung doesn't think I need to be able to touch all of my phone. Um, they built this for someone else. Uh, he's about three inches taller and has much larger hands than I do, um, which is like, you know, haha, I can't use my phone. Um, but, you know, she also talks about design in the sense of, Female crash test dummies are only required to be used in the passenger seat, um, which means I am 47% more likely to be seriously injured in a car accident and 71% more likely to be moderately injured in a car accident if I'm the driver, um, because statistically, I'm a little shorter, my hips are a little wider, so my legs are a little longer. So I'm actually always out of position, right? I'm an out of position driver, um, which is, you know, Kind of silly since 50% of drivers are women. Um, and it, it, it just, this is, this is just one of those books that then I just, I just wanted to talk about um, and talk about and talk about. Um, and like I said, I would mention medicine. Um, you know, pretty much from the beginning, they think about a drug all the way up through, you know, it's, it's a male, male cell line they use, it's male mice they use, it's men they recruit for the clinical trials. And then they're surprised when it doesn't work on half the population. Um, 
and think of all the drugs we could miss, be missing that would work on females but don't work on men, um, which is just, you know, kind of a bummer. And though, even though the FDA requires sex disaggregated data in order to be approved, 40% of drugs that are approved don't have sex disaggregated data, um, right? Like I'm turning into like that the person next to you at the dinner party that you're either finding like super interesting and you're like, oh man, tell me more about how like this world like isn't built for women. Um, but you know, some of it is literally like, it's annoying. It kills people. It affects our economies. Um, you know, I'll, I'll leave you with the one that I think gets cited the most, which is if I'm having a heart attack, my left arm statistically isn't going to go numb. I don't have tightness in my chest. I'm going to have stomach pain. I'm going to be breathless. I'm going to be nauseous. I'm going to have fatigue. Um, I'm going to be younger than a man who would typically have a heart attack. And if I go to a doctor, on average, one out of five of them is going to know that this is what a heart attack looks like in a woman, um, which you know, my heart isn't working. So I'd really like someone to look into that and not wonder like, you know, why my stomach hurts. Um, so I think unlike the other books that we've talked about so far, this is less of like a call to action and more of just a like, oh, wow, the world isn't at all what I thought it was. Um, and, you know, as someone who now collects data and mentors people who will collect data, um, I think it's important to realize that. So I don't remember who's after me, Kelsey, I'm sorry. It's me, Elena. <laughs> Thank you. That was really interesting. Um, I'll just take a moment to share my screen. What you should see in a moment is a giant spoon. So if you don't see a giant spoon, please tell me. Um, one moment. Okay. Well, it is great to be here with you all. My name is Erin St. Jor, and I, um, I have a background in teaching, but I am currently a student at the Institute for Advanced Analytics. So I'm still learning about a lot of these uh, issues and topics that we're discussing today. But I'm thrilled to have a few minutes to serve you my book review of Technically Wrong, Sexist Apps, Biased Algorithms, and Other Threats of Toxic Tech. And this is by Sarah Watcher or Walker Betcher. Um, this book, in my opinion, appeals to a technical and non-technical audience, making it a great book to reach for whether you are just venturing into the data science or tech space or have been involved in these spaces for a while. Uh, chapter by chapter, the author discusses issues that come with treating uh, or with the tech industry treating white, straight, cisgender people as normal and designing their apps, algorithms, and work environments to feed into that perceived normality. But one thing I want to tell you was that was really cool about reading this book is that I read it alongside many of my classmates as part of a weekly book club. So I was able to not only learn from the author, but also from the reactions of my classmates to the author's words. So for the next few minutes, I will share ideas from the author that my classmates and I most resonated with, and then I will share an overarching problem in the tech world and then two solutions that my classmates and I identified in the book. Before sharing her ideas though, just a little bit about the author. Um, Sarah Walker betcher is a web designer and tech consultant and she is currently working as a coach, author and speaker. And she states that she is dedicated to changing design and tech for good. There are three messages from the author that most resonated with my classmates and me. And this has been mentioned already today, but the first idea is that just because something is scientific and technical, it is not automatically neutral. Algorithms do not eliminate bias. They kind of outsource it, meaning we make it the machine's problem, making it feel like I, as a human, uh, do not have to be responsible for the bias that comes out of the algorithm or machine. The second idea is that uh, part of the definition of white supremacy is that whiteness should dominate society. So whether intentional or not, if you make a product that works better for white people, if you do not include people of color in your training data, you are feeding into white supremacy. And the third idea is that the tech world appears to many people as a magical, difficult to understand space. And because people or when people don't perfectly understand tech, 
they do not feel empowered to demand better from it. And all of this leads into what the author refers to as a toxic pattern. I think most of us understand that culture impacts technology, but technology is also impacting culture in both subtle and pretty striking ways. Uh, because technology is embedded into many aspects of our lives, um, when technology perpetuates issues like sexism, racism, etc., that in turn reinforces the oppression we see in our society. And left unaddressed, this cycle will continue to drive issues like sexism, racism, homophobia to become even more deeply ingrained into our lives. So this is a main problem that the book addresses. And a solution to that is accountability. Accountability is the first step toward overcoming this toxic pattern that we see by educating ourselves and the general public about the um, issues in tech we can demand better from ourselves and others as we work in the world of technology. Um, specifically, we can hold people in the tech space accountable for first, creating diverse teams and really encouraging diverse thinking. And second, following an ethical process and putting in the work uh, to keep bias from being embedded into algorithms. So I highly recommend that you read Technically Wrong but especially that you take the opportunity to talk about the book with someone else. Um, if you have any questions about this book or about the IAA's book club, I'd be happy to answer those later on, or you could reach out to me on LinkedIn. Uh, for now though, it will be our pleasure to hear from Hewitt, who will serve up our final review. Awesome, thank you, Erin. That was very interesting. Hey everybody, I will be serving up the Radical AI podcast for my portion of the presentation. If you could uh, go next. Uh, but before we get started, let me quickly introduce myself. As Erin mentioned, I am Hewitt Tesfaye, class of 2016. And like Elena, I joined SAS right after uh, graduating from the Institute. And I've been there ever since in a couple of different roles. The most recent role that I'm in is working as a data scientist in our healthcare group. The little offshoot notes that you see next to the different titles that I've held are some of the sort of extracurricular activities that I've been a part of since joining SAS a lot involved with diversity and inclusion efforts. Um, I was part of the group that started the Black Initiatives Group at SAS, um, some data for good projects. And most recently, um, Elena and myself and a couple others at SAS are advocating for starting a responsible AI program office at SAS. And that's part of the reason I chose the Radical AI podcast for this book buffet, um, although it's not a book, uh, is because I usually turn to this podcast when I'm feeling um, like I need to be reinvigorated or re-energized about this um, project that we're doing at SAS to get a responsible AI program office started. Um, so the Radical AI podcast is run by Dylan Doyle Burke and Jess Smith, who are both PhD students. Uh, Dylan actually comes from a religious background, a uh, religious studies background, uh, which is really awesome that he's bringing his humanities uh, discipline into this tech and AI space and Jess has a computer science background. So in this podcast, their, their mission is to find out what quote unquote radical means through um, people, ideas, and stories. What I really love about this podcast is that they um, provide a platform for underrepresented people in the space of artificial intelligence and machine learning to really share their ideas on uh, data justice, algorithmic justice, bias, fairness, and accountability through storytelling. Um, and although they have about you know, 50 different episodes thus far. I think there's one that comes out just about every week. Um, I wanted to highlight three episodes that stood out to me. Um, and I'm calling them the rock star lineup. It's uh, Dr. Ruha Benjamin, um, who describes herself as a sociologist who studies technology. Abba Burhani, who is a PhD student in Dublin um, and at the intersection of philosophy, ethics, and computer science. And Kathy Baxter, who is an AI um, ethics engineer at Salesforce. Um, if you can go next, thank you, Erin. Um, so we'll start off with Dr. Ruha Benjamin. Um, I wanted to point out some of the, what I'm calling mic drop moments in the episode with Dr. Ruha Benjamin. There were so many, but I wanted to pull out two that really stood out to me. Um, so Dr. Benjamin talks about this concept of benevolence and its intersection with our uh, uh, commitment to our own innocence. So she systems of oppression are often perpetuated through a distorted uh, sense of our own innocence. So 
uh, sort of defending yourself by saying, you know, I didn't know and um, you took it the wrong way. I didn't mean it for it to be that way. And how that kind of notion sort of finds its way into how we build our technology and believing that um, just because we're building technology or we believe that we're building technology to better the world, it doesn't mean that it cannot be harmful as you've seen in so many examples that uh, the people on this call have already shared with you. And how, um, you know, that staunch um, commitment to our own innocence and uh, this idea that technology is really meant to transform the world for the better uh, can continue to perpetuate systems of oppression. She also points out um, an example of IBM's involvement in the Holocaust in World War II, which totally blew my mind because I didn't know about this. Uh, but apparently IBM's tabulating machines um, and punch card system uh, technology was used in World War II to help identify and transport Jews to concentration camps, which again, totally mind blown about that and it has taken me into a bit of a rabbit hole to understand exactly what went down during that time, but also goes to show just how far back some of these examples go to the 1930s and 40s of how technology has been used um, to perpetuate oppression. Next slide. The second person is Abhuva Burhani. Again, she's a PhD student in Dublin. Uh, she comes from the part of the world that I come from, uh, which is Ethiopia, and her context of, you know, coming from the continent of Africa, uh, her perspective is unique. And the one thing that stood out to me in her episode was this concept of technological colonialism, which I hadn't heard of before, and again, sort of blew my mind. Um, she talks about how there's an influx of algorithms that are developed outside the continent of Africa that are then being used within the continent. Um, so she says, tech reflects the values, the interests, and the problems of a society. So when we're importing tech products, we're not only importing the technology, but we're importing the cultural ideals and then demanding that they be accepted as the standard. She says, and this really uh, resonated, that it feels like a reincarnation of colonialism, but in bits and bites. Uh, she also goes on to explain that no one seems to be questioning this because of all of the excitement there is around how technology is going to quote unquote save Africa. And I will be, I'll be the first to admit, I was one of those people who thought, oh, we can build models and you know, solve problems, but it's really important to be cognizant of exactly who is designing these algorithms and how they are being applied to um, a culture that the algorithm was not developed in. Next slide. And finally, Kathy Baxter. Um, so her episode came across, uh, you know, I came across it when I was going through the whole process of trying to advocate for a responsible AI program office at SAS. Um, and I was a little bit feeling a little anxious about how, how are we going to make this perfect? You know, how can we actually ensure that the technology and algorithms that we build can be as bias-free as possible? I was putting a lot of pressure on myself when I came across her, her episode, um, this gave me a little sense of relief. She says, we're never going to be able to say AI is 100% bias free. What we can say is that, you know, identified this is the type of bias we looked for. This is how we measured it. And this was the measurement that we decided was low enough to release this into the world. Um, I really like this quote because it, it just goes to show that, you know, nothing is ever perfect, but it's really important to take the responsibility of at least mitigating as much risk as we possibly can before releasing something into the world without much thought. Um, I also, after listening to this episode on the Radical AI podcast, I reached out to Kathy Baxter on LinkedIn and was very pleased and surprised to see that she not only responded, but was, was willing to chat with me for about an hour about how she got the ethics or AI ethics uh, program started at Salesforce almost single-handedly. So it was really cool to see how the Radical AI podcast sort of led to me making a connection um, with somebody in this space that's sort of creating waves. Um, so just want to point out that the Radical AI podcast, you can find it on the podcast app if you have an iPhone or on Spotify or iHeartRadio apparently. So tune in to stay plugged into what's going on in the space of data justice uh, and bias in AI. So with that, I'll wrap up the Radical AI podcast section. Erin, if you can kindly go next. Um, if you guys are still hungry for more, uh, there are a couple more recommendations here, and I think Kelsey will add um, a link to resources that we've compiled in the chat. Um, we have, you know, Weapons of Math Destruction by Kathy O'Neill. That's um, uh, Aaron's actually leading a, a book club right now with the current IA students on this book. 
Um, that's kind of a classic in this space. Dr. Ruha Benjamin's Race After Technologies, another big one that she references quite a bit in her episode on the Radical AI podcast. And the bottom left corner, we also have Coded Bias, which is a film that came out last year. And it features and centers around Joy Bulanwini, who is um, a pretty prominent researcher who um, has been advocating for and, and has brought to light the um, racial and gender disparities that exist with facial recognition technology. All right, so with that, I'll pass it off to Emily uh, to tell us you know, what you all can do after listening to all of the resources we've covered today. Awesome, thanks. Yeah, I'm gonna kick us off with some action steps. And I've got number one, which is be self-aware. Commit to active reflection and decentering to mitigate personal biases. And what this really is, is this is coming to terms of the, the worldview and the perspective that you have and that you put when you interact with the world. For me, this was coming to terms uh, with the both the privileges and the challenges I face as a white woman um, and uh, thinking about the ways that I bring this perspective to the space and how important it is for me to have an understanding of the history of marginalized communities um, for the development of the work that I do. I'm going to pass it off to the second action step. All right, so my step is that you should examine your surroundings. So what that means is to pay attention to systemic and socio-technological uh, injustices in the world. And so what this means to me is that as data scientists uh, or data, uh, I guess, practitioners, um, we need to be aware of so many aspects of what we're doing, right? Elena touched on uh, our data collection techniques. Uh, we need to, uh, you know, examine who is our audience. Um, what communities are we impacting? What communities are we not impacting? Um, how are we measuring this impact? Um, things like that. Um, and so it's truly not, unfortunately, it's not difficult to see so many different types of oppression in our society. Um, but what's most important is that we ourselves cannot decide what is and what is not oppression and what is the correct solution. We have to ask and listen to the communities that are themselves facing and experiencing um, this injustice. It's so now I'll pass it off to Elena to discuss step three. And like I mentioned, I, I truly believe we gotta be talking about this. Um, you know, in the before times, this is literally the only thing I would talk to the person next to me on the plane about. Like I have no interest in talking to strangers, I guess, unless that stranger Andrew wants to talk about like the way that like bias exists um, and you know everything from the way that you know we assign bail amounts to people to the way that we order um, order people in order of importance to you know give them housing like Marshall talked about um, you know the other day my mom was reading a news article and she said well, but isn't this, you know, isn't this algorithm really biased because, you know, the data that went into it was probably biased. And I was like, oh, you know, seven years of saying this out loud um, and my 69 year old mother like gets it. Um, so I, I truly believe in the grassroots, like talk, talk on social media, talk to your professors, talk to your fellow students, talk to your parents, talk to the person in the grocery line from six feet apart while wearing, you know, at least two masks, you know, talk about these. Uh, so the last takeaway we have for you is to stay plugged in, uh, you know, staying involved and updated on these issues is really important because technology and policy around them is definitely changing really fast. Uh, the, the easiest thing you can do is just start following some of the authors of these uh, resources or the people who are on the podcast see what they're talking about, see who they're following and kind of get plugged into that community. Um, hopefully these are four things you can kind of wrap up in a to-go box and carry out with you today. Uh, since um, these are really important issues, like Elena said, that we need to keep talking about. And with that, uh, we'll go to the next slide. And just wanted to say a quick thank you to everyone who attended, uh, all our amazing speakers. I know I definitely learned a lot about uh, the, these other resources that I haven't had a chance to dig into yet. Uh, definitely thank you to the IAA for having us on today and being able to share this topic. Um, and I think we're all sticking around a little bit for a Q&A and a discussion. So definitely keep putting in anything you want to talk about in the Q&A and we will uh, have, a, have a chat. Thanks again.
Awesome. Well, thank you, Kelsey, Marshall, Elena, Aaron, and Hewitt for these wonderful discussions you all have led today. Um, as a reminder to everyone, we will, uh, we have recorded today's session and we will send it out um, via email to everyone who is registered for today's event. So you can feel free to share with your network and continue to amplify this discussion that we're talking about today. Um, Kelsey has also shared a book buffet resource list in the chat, which we will include in that email as well. Um, um, but my colleague Val Schultz, the head of admissions at the Institute, and I will help um, moderate some of the questions you all have listed in the Q&A. Please feel free to add more. Um, but our first question goes to Emily Hadley. Um, so for Emily, do you think that in a point of time in the future, search engines can, in, can be improved to possibly reduce the issues of bias in the engines themselves? Um, an example, the scoring system of appropriate search terms. Yeah, I think this is a great question. I certainly think that search engines can be improved. Um, I think it's it's important, though, uh, to recognize that there is no, again, no neutral, unbiased way to, in which to ever present information. And so I think the first piece that Google and search engine companies could do is to admit that, admit that they are responsible for, um, you know, cultivating some of the search and then bring in the people who can inform those decisions and, and make and improve the algorithms. And, and that includes, you know, actively being anti-racist and actively committing to reducing homophobia and sexism and anti-Semitism and racism. And, um, you know, it, it does require making statements um, about values um, because ultimately that's what, what an algorithm is doing. Um, so yes, I think they can be improved, um, but I, I don't think we're working towards a world that's necessarily free of, of bias in the, the loosest form of that definition. Thank you, Emily. Um, our next question comes from Andrew, who is curious about all of your thoughts on corporations real interest in investigating and treating these topics as real problems. It seems that without real and by real he means financial consequences, uh, like for example, the FDIC leveraging penalties for violating fair lending laws, uh, companies are more motivated to just take actions like establishing offices or committees to improve the company's image or to placate employees than in fundamentally actually changing their business processes. So what are any of your thoughts on that? I can kick us off. Uh, I think search algorithms would look really different if Google could be sued for people finding uh, information about bombs or finding information about how to commit mass murder or all of these things that you can find information on on Google. So I definitely support the statement that federal regulation and financial consequences, I think at the end of the day, are what are going to, to make these companies change. And I apologize for forgetting to raise my hand. <laughs> okay, did you wanna to add to that? Yeah, I just wanted to kind of think about of what Emily was saying that regulation is coming, um, like wide regulation around AI. Uh, I think the EU is leading the charge there with uh, a proposal for regulation that's slotted to come out Q1 of this year. And it's expected to have a bit of a, like a global ripple effect similar to the way GDPR did. Um, now we'll see if the US follows suit or not, um, that's yet to be seen. But I think there is regulation that, you know, that can be modeled after once the EU takes the first step towards that step, um, which I think is gonna be great because um, unless there are like real consequences, financial consequences or reputation loss consequences, I, I feel like a lot of organizations and corporations are very slow to act. Um, a good example of this could also be Amazon's facial recognition technology that's been sold to law enforcement for, for a while and they didn't pull out of that market. I don't know if they still have, but until 2020, I think is when a lot of organizations were pulling out of the facial recognition market, including IBM. Um, even though there was like a lot of research that showed uh, that facial recognition technology is not very accurate for darker skinned individuals, um, specifically darker skinned women. Um, so regardless of all of that evidence that was out there, they still were like, eh, we're still going to continue selling this technology to law enforcement. Um, so I think it was only 2020 when there was so much um, advocacy and social unrest that I, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, Amazon may have uh, stopped, if I'm not mistaken. But um, I, I agree that the law, you know, legal ramifications would probably be the best way to motivate corporations to do the right thing. Any, uh, anything else you'd want to add, Alina? 
I mean, it's it's obvious. Hugh and I talk about this all all the time. It's obvious that legal ramifications are the best way. But I think if we're going to wait for legal ramifications, we're going to be waiting a long time. Um, which is why I, I I do believe in the power of amplification and grassroots efforts and people who work at the companies caring and being aware of what's happening. Um, you know, I know at SAS, right? Like the conversation about bias in AI has, you know, at times been very grassroots and that has sort of risen up into, you know, the formation of a, you know, quote, office of responsible AI, you know, since you threw that in the quotes, Valerie, but, you know, you have to start somewhere. And when Facebook employees walk off, when Twitter employees walk off, when people take responsibility for what their company is doing at some point like there is a mass you know facebook can always find people to work for them but i don't know i this is such a hard question because when it comes down to it companies care about dollars and you have to figure out how to affect that dollar if i may add again um, i completely agree with elena saying about how responsibility doesn't always lie with of course, it lies with the corporations that are creating these technologies, but it also lies with us as the consumers. And uh, Dr. Ruha Benjamin mentions this in her episode on radical AI um, about how we can model, not always, but in certain, certain circumstances, we can model the uh, efforts, grassroots efforts that were um, conducted by medical students that created the white coats for Black Lives movement, uh, which is basically demanding um, academic institutions, medical schools to have uh, specific courses around how racism shows up in the medical system in clinical practice. Um, and they've all they've gone to the uh, to the extent of creating a report card for uh, different medical schools, which is amazing to see Harvard getting C's across the board <laughs> across 14 different metrics. Um, and that is actually starting to make some kind of a change. So we as consumers oftentimes will opt for convenience over, I guess, things that are right uh, and sometimes it's important for us to be cognizant of what we choose to consume and what we choose to support um so just wanted to add that too kelsey go ahead sorry i keep going in now um i just wanted to add on what he was saying um there's a movement uh called tech won't build it which i think is kind of along the same lines as the dot white coats for black lives um just where tech workers from a lot of these big companies will be like, oh, you know, we're not going to build this sort of technology because we know it's oppressive in these ways, uh, which is really, you know, it, it shouldn't be on maybe the workers, but here's where we are. And, and just seeing those kind of movements within these big companies is really uh, encouraging. Awesome. All right, we have one question that's for Aaron, but if anyone else would like to chime in, please feel free to do so. So in a workplace, when meetings or seminars aid in making people more aware of the impact of data in society, and they don't just mean data practitioners, but also everyone in the business that deals with data. I think a short answer to that is yes, absolutely. You know, any information you can share about these issues is going to be helpful so that you can hold people accountable because you can't hold people accountable who don't you know who don't have that information. Um, so I think that's a great place to start. Like everyone has just mentioned, you know, getting that that push going in the internal um, organization uh, in order to drive change. But it could also be like Elena mentioned, you know, uh, the person next to you on your next flight, whenever that may be, you know, just getting the average consumer or helping them to become aware of these issues and ask questions. Um, so any, any practitioner of data, you know, whether it's the people gathering information, the people using it to um, find answers or the people deploying the, the plan that was found. I mean, across the spectrum, you can be asking those questions and holding yourself and others accountable. Um, so I do think in a workplace, I, that would be a, a great place to start. I'm curious to hear what other people think as well. I know Elena and Hewitt have mentioned some of the efforts they've engaged in at FAST. Um, so do you guys have any thoughts on kind of expanding this practice beyond just the data professionals, but the entire organization as a whole? Yeah, I think I'm going to go next and Elena can chime in. Um, for us, 
I think it was, you know, Elena is the one that really pulled me into the fold of this topic because she got, you know, asked that question by a customer and she's like, wait a second, we're not thinking about this right. And it's like, we wrote a SAS Global Forum paper on the topic of human bias and machine learning. And that is one of the channels within SAS to get sort of your ideas out there and get um, to, a certain to a certain extent recognized, right? And then that leads into other additional platforms that you get invited to, to expand on your thoughts and your ideas in this space. Um, so I think it was very much um, a grassroots effort that started off with a, with a paper that we wrote and then kind of snowballed into, let's gather everybody who is talking about this topic and let's all meet and see what comes of that. And then we realized, okay, there are employees across the company globally, not just in the US, who have been you know, doing presentations on this topic and thinking about writing books on this topic and things like that. So we're like, okay, we have sort of a, um, a, a bit of a movement here going on. And so we took it even further to say, can we get a meeting with senior leadership to tell them about the momentum that we're seeing, not just within SaaS, but what our customers are asking us, what we're seeing in the market. And the more we start presenting to senior leadership, we realized they get it for the most part. Not everybody does, but for the most part, they get it and they want to see how all of this comes to fruition. So we're still in that process of continuing to advocate, but it's still at this stage, a bottom up effort. We'd love for it to be like top down. We want you know our senior leadership to recognize the need and sort of push that message down instead of us trying to lift it up as much as we can. But to be fair, right, mm -hmm. we have like SAS recently instituted um, like bias training that talks both about like bias in the workplace, like, the, you know, the regular bias that everyone um, has probably been subjected to at one point in their life, um, unless they have not, um, but also bias in algorithms, right? And, and because we're SAS, I, I really like that we, we did that and we made literally everyone take it. So, you know, 14,000 people took that training um, and a lot of of people reached out and I, I do think you know if the question was does training help a hundred percent right there are so many people out there right a lot of times we're in our bubble and we're like oh, of course people have you know experienced bias and then we take a step back and we're like oh wait like you know when we say human we mean man and in this case you know those some humans have not experienced bias and they just sort of need a little push to get their eyes open so a hundred percent if the question was should we be teaching people about it? We should be teaching people about this in middle school. Like forget workplace. Like th this is a two plus two is four. And where do those twos come from? And do they actually add up? Like, let's let's talk about where everything came from. Right, I agree with that. And, you know, there's also another thing that I'm pretty proud of that we're doing here at SAS is uh, training through storytelling, through conversation. Right, so we have every Friday, what we call Big Fridays. It's named after the Black Initiatives Group, acronym BIG. And so BIG hosts a meeting every Friday where just about anybody can dial in. And there's always a theme or a topic that we discuss, but it's usually framed from the, pers the Black perspective since it's like, you know, sort of organized by Black employees at SAS and a safe space for people to lean into uncomfortable discussions and try to learn about what's going on. Um, and I think that's been also a good space for people to sort of understand that their lived experience might not be the same as their colleagues' lived experiences. And I'm learning a lot too in that format since I'm having to explain my lived experience to people who not, may not necessarily understand um, what I'm going through. But it's, it's, I think that's also been very helpful in trying to understand or explain what bias looks like in the work context as well as in our personal lives. Yeah, because I think they took that, you know, idea and then they put it in the training because yeah. I remember like we had the like small groups and literally like hearing your employees talk about how they were racially profiled in the like the parking lot. You're just like, you know, I, I think there were a lot of eye openings happening, um, which is just important. Thank you all for that. Um, so we are almost at one o'clock. Um, I want to invite anyone attendees or panelists who may need to drop off the call at this time, please feel free to do so. We won't uh, be offended if you need to depart at this point. We wanna be respectful of your time. If you are willing and able to stick with us, we do have a couple of more questions. Um, so this one is from Carlos. He says, you've given a lot of examples of companies, organizations that are not doing it right. 
is someone or any companies doing it right? And what does good look like? Go ahead, Kelsey. I can start. Um, I think you'd actually really like data feminism because they really do try to provide examples on what this looks like, what their principles look like in practice. Um, but it doesn't always look like, you know, that, uh, you know, all solution AI model that's going to like fix the world and change everything. It's, it's much smaller scale. It's working directly with the communities that are impacted and that need to benefit from this work. Um, so it, it might not look like the big marketing pushes that we're kind of been used to the last few years about how tech is going to like reimagine everything and solve all the world's problems. Um, but I think there is a potential there for tech to make a difference if we can change around like what the goals are um, a little bit. Uh, so definitely check out data feminism. I think they have a lot of good examples. Uh, one that comes to mind is like working with, uh, you know, I, I'm not gonna just read the book. I'm not gonna remember it to the, <laughs> we'll just, just read the book. Lots of good examples. Go ahead, Emily. Yeah, I was just going to add, um, it's it's pretty hard to know from the outside if you're not working for a company, you know, what they're actually putting into practice, because they can certainly like create these offices and say they're doing particular things. But if you're not in the room with the other data scientists, when you're making decisions about, you know, how to group different racial and ethnic categories together, whose data you're collecting, whose data you're keeping, whose data you're destroying, how you're going to communicate the data, like, that's where the decisions that end up in biased results are often made. Um, and those are not published widely. Like those are those are held held pretty close, and, and oftentimes not necessarily interrogated. So um, I would say I think there are a lot of companies that sound like they're doing really great things. I'm excited to see kind of where that work is headed, but it also means like they should be hiring more more diverse employees. They should be putting in place some of these trainings and things that were just described that SAS is doing. Like th there's a lot of work that needs to be done. Um, and just putting out a statement that your company like doesn't stand for bias and AI is not enough. So um, I, I think I'm excited to see what companies are working on and I'm hesitant to call anyone out as like doing really great things if I'm not, um, you know, in the room when that happens. All right. Anything else to add to that one? I think we had another question. Um, yes. So I think um, Emily may have addressed this over chat, but just for anyone who um, didn't get a chance to, to see her response, Colin asked, um, so in the podcast, the use of metrics to measure bias in an app or algorithm is mentioned. Could we get an example of one of these metrics or how they're chosen? And how does one turn racism into a measurable metric? I'll just comment that the um, the piece that I shared um, comes out of the University of Chicago. They put together a great bias and fairness audit, which I think is a good example of some of the most common metrics that we see in this space, such as using false positive rate um, parity, false discovery rate parity, false negative rate parity. Uh, there's a lot that goes into this. I'm currently working on a criminal justice project at RTI where, where our goal is to evaluate the bias of the algorithm. And we have like 10 different things that we measure. So I think this is just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to that, because um, there's a lot of ways to introduce it, but I think it's a good starting point if you're interested in an applied version. If I may add to that too, also Emily, we should totally connect <laughs> so I can learn more about how you guys are going about this, but there's also concepts around group fairness, like is my model performing similarly across different subpopulations that, you know, that I'm trying to apply this model to. There's concepts around individual fairness. Do two individuals that have very similar characteristics receive the same prediction or output from the model? And if they don't, why? Um, there's other concepts like counterfactual fairness that you can also look for. Um, and then there are also models that could potentially um, include constraints within their objective function to sort of force fairness. Um, so that has its pros and cons, but there's a lot of research and work being done in this space right now. It's really, honestly, there's, because of all the momentum that's going on in this space, there's always something new to look forward to. So just a quick Google search can probably lead you to like several rabbit holes, but it's really interesting. 
Awesome. Well, thank you all once again for a very thought provoking discussion you've had here. And we've had some wonderful resources shared via the chat that we'll make sure to send out as well. Um, so we want to thank you all for leading today's discussion and thank our attendees for tuning in and asking some great questions. Um, as a reminder, we will send out the recording for today's discussion along with all of the resources that were shared during the presentation. So this concludes our webinar for exploring data science. So thank you all for your time and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day.